On Wednesday, the International Energy Agency released the uh, World Energy Outlook for 2021. And I'm going to talk to Kingsmill Bond, who's a financial analyst at Carbon Tracker about that. And he joins us from London in the UK. So welcome to the interview, Kingsmill. Hi, Mark. And nice to see you. Look, this is a historic uh, report in many ways uh, and a bit of a departure from previous world energy outlooks. Give us your uh, brief, and, and I know that's difficult because this is a weighty document, but give us your brief summary of, of uh, the outlook this year. Well, I, I think you're right to say this is a historic document because the uh, International Energy Agency for many years was the um, one of the primary supporters of the status quo and business as usual and uh, continuing to expand the fossil fuel economy and and now over the last couple of years and particularly signified by this report um they have come out with a completely new approach um which basically says uh we can do this and it's a better solution and here's how to do it and that was the exciting uh Im impactful and important uh change this year well, let's let's talk about that. So we have uh, three scenarios. We've got the stated policies, which gets us to 2.6 degrees of warming by the end of uh, the century. We've got the announced policies that uh, gets us to announced pledges. Announced pledges, sorry, uh, gets us to 2.1 degrees. And then we have the net zero, uh, which uh, scenario, which gets us to 1.5 degrees. And the difference, as I understand it, between the announced pledges and net zero, uh, that's our ambition gap. That's our ambition gap. So it's really clever the way they've constructed this because they've now got three scenarios um, between these three scenarios. So you need to think of them in sort of in English business as usual, um, what our governments say they want to do and what governments need to do. That's basically what they are. Um, and what's clever then is that you then get these two gaps. So the, the gap between where we're going, business as usual, and uh, what the governments say they want to do is what they call the implementation gap. That's to say, you know, this is the stuff we actually need to figure out how to do. Um, and, and, and they've gone into that in a lot of detail in this report. And then the gap between what our governments now say they want to do, which is um, the, the APS scenario and, and uh, net zero is, is the kind of the ambition scenario where our leaders need to up their game. And they've also gone into enormous amounts of detail as to what needs to be done there. And for example, they figured out that 40 percent of that particular gap can be filled with zero cost policies. And, and one of the points they make and made extremely powerfully at the press conference is just to say, well, look, why, why are we talking about this? With all these <laughs> zero cost policies, let's just get on with it. Right, and well, let's talk about some of the key messages here, uh, Kingsmill, and this is something, uh, the big one, uh, that is one that energy media has reported on for years and years, and that is the energy transition going on. And, and as, as you describe it, a virtual circle of policy action and technology innovation. In essays, I've described it as if you think of the energy transition as a bus and the uh, climate policy as the accelerator pedal, then if you want to go faster, press harder on the policy pedal. And uh, would you agree with that? It's yes, very nicely put. Um, it, 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 it does. I mean, it does um, have, have the ring of um, Markham Hislop, what um, the IEA is now saying. You know, we're moving to a new energy economy. It will be better, they say, than the fossil fuel economy. It will be cheaper, cleaner, fairer, more resilient, safer, and with higher GDP growth. I mean, these are all arguments that you and I, I think, have been making for a while, but it's, it's refreshing to hear them in the mouth uh, of, of the International Energy Agency. So if uh, policymakers uh, need to speed it up, let's talk about the, the this issue of uh, the ener cost of the energy transition being low. And I mean, this is a point that is often lost is, you know, we look at back at previous energy transitions, like the one uh, from, uh, you know, to uh, uh, the internal combustion engine and uh, gasoline and diesel. And it dramatically lowered costs and, of transportation, and it, it really changed a lot about uh, our economies and, and uh, our, how we live and how we worked. Uh, that was 100 years ago or so. And these uh, new energy technologies like wind and, and solar and batteries and electric vehicles and so on promise to do the same. This, we're, we're, this is actually not a penalty that we're incurring. This, this is a, a, an era of lower costs and, and low, better, uh, broader access to, to uh, cheap uh, energy. 
and a lot of people will be lifted out of poverty and others will uh, will enjoy better jobs and a higher standard of living. Now, that's a bit of a rant on my part, but if, if I got got that more or less right? Yeah, I, th I think the, the IEA didn't go quite so far as all that, but they do say, for example, that there'll be more jobs um, in a renewable energy economy between 13 and, and 26 million extra jobs. They say that household bills will go down um, because the overall costs of, of renewables uh, to provide energy will be lower than the business as usual. Um, they haven't actually uh, f figured out um, the, the difference. Well, they do figure out the difference in CapEx, but they don't include the difference in OPEX. So actually you can't do the, a complete comparison, but I think that's included or implicit within the observation about household bills coming down over time. And they do indeed make exactly this point that this is a far better solution um, for people to get distributed energy. And in a separate report, they've talked a lot about how it's renewables that will get energy to the 880 million people in the world who don't uh, currently have electricity, for example. Well, let's talk about uh, the uh, the technologies themselves. And the, point, the uh, report makes the point that we essentially have all the technologies that we need. We don't need a miracle energy technology like Bill Gates says. We essentially have all everything we need. We just need to get on with it. Yeah, in fact, they, they, they do say that we still need to put a lot of, one of the four areas that they focus on is we need to put a lot of money into solving some of these hard to solve sectors such as steel um, or cement. Um, but you're quite right to say that they say we have all the technologies we need to get on with it today and for the 2030s. Um, and, and that's the absolutely key point. I mean, if you, if you put yourself back 10 years ago um, uh, and, and, and said, well, you know, in, in 2010, well, solar doesn't seem to be cheap enough for us to roll it out, you know, that would not have been a particularly helpful observation because what happens over time is that as costs fall, um, new opportunities materialize. So the key point is that if we've got enough to be getting on with it for the next decade, let's do that. And that's what they say very, very clearly in, in this report. There's plenty of, of deployment. Another number they gave for the first time, they said, look, actually 800 gigawatts of new solar and wind can be installed now at zero cost to the system because it's it's cheaper and that can be put out now and okay that's a number which has been highly debated a lot of those who are opposing change have been saying well, it's very very expensive and it's really i think powerful to have someone as, as credible as the iea with a very detailed analysis coming out and saying actually no you can do a lot of this stuff right now at, at, at a zero economic cost well let's talk about what can be done during the uh, 2020s and you've got four areas of action that you uh, pulled from the report maybe you could describe those well, actually, I mean, these are the four areas that the IEA focuses on um, for, for the 2020s. So you've got uh, the decarbonization of electricity, um, and they talk about, well, a number of areas, but rolling out renewables faster, um, uh, reducing coal specifically, and building more uh, energy, e electricity infrastructure, and then, of course, improving power market design. And that, that point about power market design is you hear so often, that's the key issue in, in many, many countries. I mean, I think CFLI, for example, have said that half of the world hasn't even put into place any policy yet. Anyway, that's one area. The second area um, is to stop methane leaks. I mean, this has been a, a real, this has really risen up the agenda in the last six months. The Energy Transition Commission's also talked about stopping methane leaks. It's a really easy win. Um, again, the IEA in a separate paper said that 40% of methane leaks to, to, to plug them would have zero cost. Um, and actually the, most of the rest of it is also very low cost. So, I mean, here's an area where the, the gas industry can clean up its act and slightly increase its social legitimacy as a result of doing that. And, and it's pretty easy to do. So that's, that's step two. Um, uh, step three, uh, again, often talked about and, and probably the hardest, most expensive area is a, a, a continuing hard work on improving efficiency um, right across the board. And then, you know, finally step four, that, that I mentioned earlier is investing in these new energy technologies so that in 10 years time, when we start to hit the current ceiling, actually new technologies are coming through in order to solve those, uh, the, the, those barriers. There's a Canadian economist, Jason Dion, who wrote a, a piece, a, a very good report about decarbonizing, uh, decarbonization pathways for, for the Canadian economy. And he had two types of uh, technologies. The safe bets, uh, those are, you know, like electric vehicles, uh, you know, that are already competitive with internal combustion engines and, the, you know, wind and solar and, and other kinds of technologies. And then there were the wild cards, which are 
um, you know, hydrogen, and he included uh, small uh, modular nuclear reactors in, in that group. And those are ones that we should continue to invest in because we will need them in the 20s and the and 2030s and, and the 2040s. And they're not proven yet, and they're not uh, the low-cost technology yet, but they very well could be, and we should start putting money into them. So I, I think that fits very well that framework uh, helps to explain a lot of how we approach this. Do what you can now with technologies that are low cost and competitive, and then keep investing in those that are the wild cards and that we will need, as you say, when we kind of hit the wall, we need to get to the next stage in the 2030s and 2040s. So my question is, I agree with all four of those things. What about electrifying transportation? I'm, I was surprised that wasn't uh, the, the fifth point. They, they 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 also talk about um uh that that's sort of part of part of a part of their story is the, the necessity to electrify um uh transportation systems faster and they talk about banning bringing forward bounds of, of of electric vehicles but can i come back to this question if i may a little bit about wild cards and wild card technologies versus um credible technologies i i think you know wild card technologies would be would indeed be you know small modular nuclear or waves or um uh, possibly, you know, geothermal. Something like hydrogen at the moment looks like it's a pretty sure bet solution um, because you hydrogen, of course, is so special because it can basically solve all of the areas that other LNG technologies can't solve, and it's um, d d discrete and um, can be uh, can be done at scale, and therefore it looks like it's on exactly the same kind of learning curves as solar and wind, and therefore it's completely credible to imagine. As, as um, a, a recent paper from Oxford University has argued that hydrogen could be the, the fourth horseman of the energy transition. So I wouldn't call it quite a wildcard technology for what it's worth. Um, sorry, I mean, I go a little bit beyond my brief as to what the IEA is focusing on, um, but, but, but yeah. Yeah, okay, fair comment. Well, let's talk about fossil fuel demand because that was addressed in the uh, in the outlook and is, uh, I can tell you in Canada and certain parts of the US, uh, a, a topic of intense debate uh, by the because a lot of people are pointing to the current uh, energy crisis in the UK and other places and rising energy costs around the world and saying, well, look, there's a shortage of oil. There's a shortage of natural gas. What do you mean we're talking about peak oil demand? How can that happen? So, so this was really interesting. Fatih Birol went out of his way at the beginning of the press conference to say specifically that the reason for the, the spike in fossil fuel prices right now is nothing to do with the shift to renewables. It's caused by the bounce back from COVID. We've had the largest increase in demand I, I think we've ever seen or nearly we've ever seen at the same time as COVID is interfering with the supply chain. But to be clear, in 2021, we're not going to reach 2019 levels of fossil fuel demand. Um, we're still significantly lower. And in the IEA's forecast, for example, in no scenario does fossil fuel demand for electricity ever get back to the 2019 levels. Only in one of their three core scenarios does global fossil fuel demand increase beyond the 2019 levels. And even then, it's only a little bit and for a few years you get a peak in 2025. So this is very different. I mean in most IEA scenarios we've had in the past we've you know we've had peaks never materializing or so far in the future is just not being sensible. Now suddenly two out of three scenarios it's already happened in 2019. In one scenario it's about to happen in four years time only marginally higher than we are today. Um, you know you shouldn't confuse a short-term tactical COVID caused problem, which is what we face now, with, with the long-term strategic shift that's going on. It, 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 they're just different things. I wanna get back to this idea of that the energy transition is low cost for uh, how, homeowners, householders. Uh, because this of course is a, a big issue uh, for folks, especially now when they see their, their fuel costs rising, that's what they worry about. You know, it's a pocketbook issue. So explain uh, the IEA's position on this, Kings Mill, where their, their householder costs will actually fall over time. So what they do um, is, is they've gone into enormous detail um, as to whether or not this is accurate, incidentally, is, is slightly moot because it's so complex and it's a long way in the future. But anyway, for what it's worth, what they've done is they've figured out what the cost of um, 
uh, energy from a renewable system versus the cost of energy from a fossil fuel system would be in 2030. And they concluded that it would be lower in a renewables based system. And the reason for that is the point that they make, which is that you can put a huge amount of solar and wind into the system at lower economic cost because the costs are so low. Um, uh, so, so that's a, an interesting and particularly surprising conclusion coming from the IEA. And I'll come on to this possibly in a minute because it, that's the conclusion they make even when they're being extremely conservative about renewables costs. I mean, that's an important caveat to our own enthusiasm about this report. Um, and not, we wouldn't necessarily agree with all, all aspects of it. Um, and, and that's really significant. The other point that they did is they, they then stress tested future um, pr prices in the event of another um, or oil and gas squeeze, what would happen to household bills? And of course, the answer is that in a renewables based or, or, or in a more renewables based system in 2030, you wouldn't be so stressed by, by high oil and gas prices, but it'd be, if you maintain the current system, be much more stressed. I mean, that's sort of completely obvious. And I think this is a point that people miss in the current debate. The reason to state the obvious why um, it's painful to have high gas prices is because we've got so much gas in the mix. And therefore, if we had less gas in the mix, then surprisingly enough, <laughs> we wouldn't be so stressed by high prices. I mean, why this escapes people is slightly me beyond me. But anyway, that's the, the main point here. Well, another uh, issue that will be of interest to householders is jobs. And uh, I think that we can look back to previous energy transitions. And generally, while some jobs are always destroyed and famous buggy whip manufacturers put out of business by the rise of the automobile industry, overall, it creates a lot more jobs. And the IEA is kind of looking, uh, expects the same thing to happen this time around. Yeah, I, I mean, let's be clear. I, Irina were the first people to do this calculation on jobs. Um, and to say there will be more jobs in, in, under the energy transition. For, the IEA has quantified this and they've got it you know, in detail where the jobs come um, in solar or wind and batteries and um, biofuels and so on and so forth. Um, so it's really good to get the detail. I think one of, for me, one of the other uh, data points that they said, they said 75% of the jobs will be local. So, so put yourself in the shoes of a fossil fuel importer. Um, what does this mean? It means not merely do you reduce your fossil fuel imports, your import bill, and your balance of payments problems that you've been having, but also you're going to get 75% of those, sorry, you're going to get a whole load of new jobs, because at the moment all the jobs are, are, are abroad extracting this stuff, and now you're going to get all those jobs at home. So for importers, it's a really, really obvious game. Um, I think the other point that the IEA stressed, and it's very, very well made, is that you know we've got to stop kidding ourselves and pretending that the existence of, 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 of communities um, which are extracting fossil fuels stops the energy transition. It's going to happen anyway, guys. What we need to do is we need to go to these guys and find new roles for them. And we need to do it now. We, you know, there's no point waiting for 10 years and then saying, oh, I'm sorry, you, know, you don't have a job anymore. Um, we need to get on with it and we need to go on with it right now and think about it. Because if you don't, you get a lot of opposition, you get a lot of hardship in these communities that we know very well in the UK with our relatively badly handled coal transition in the, in the 1980s. Um, the, the, there are better ways to do this and fairer ways to do it as well. Now, another point that gets made is that, uh, and I think this, this, these are your words, it's a bumpy road uh, at the top, and, uh, or a bumpy road to the top, for sure. The, uh, I've often said that the 2020s are going to be this really disruptive decade of, of this energy transition. And it is not just because things are getting cheaper uh, and better and so on, doesn't mean that when you disrupt something that it's smooth sailing. It's exactly the opposite of that. And I think that's one thing we have to prepare ourselves for, especially during the 2020s as we embark on the energy transition in earnest, is buckle up. It's going to be a bumpy ride. Yeah, I, I think for this possibly is something that you and I should have thought through a little bit harder. And it's, it's a very fair point. I mean, if, 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 well, I'm sure you thought about it, Mark, and I hadn't necessarily thought about it enough. It will be difficult because what's happening now is that um, you're having less investment. It doesn't make any sense, obviously, to, to, to invest in 30 year fossil fuel assets. Um, and, and yet, if you haven't yet put into place the policy frameworks for renewables to replace them, then you are going to get the kind of bumpy, uh, 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 problems we're currently uh, facing. So 
and this will be re this will be um, re replicated, I guess, during the course of of this decade. I don't think it'll be nearly so bad as what we're facing now, because what we're facing now is a kind of special COVID situation. But what it really means is that you've got to plan ahead. You need you you can no longer have enough flexibility for a fossil fuel system. You need to increase your flexibility for a renewable system. There's no point having a a policy framework which is tooled up for fossil fuels. And, and sort of allows renewables in, you've actually got to rethink your policy framework from first principles. And, and that, you know, there's no point having a taxation system, for example, um, which has in the UK rewards gas at the expense, rewards um, uh, gas at the expense of electricity. You really got to think, rethink your um, your taxation system, taxation system. So people across the world are beginning to realize that actually quite a lot needs to happen. Um, and, and when it comes to the bumpy ride, I think if I may, may use an analogy, which I've been using quite a lot recently, but, but actually gives a very good framework to how to think about this. Um, if you've got discrete goods like um, cars or electric vehicles or mobile phones, it's quite reasonable to think in terms of a Matterhorn of, of, um, of demand, you know, peak and decline, that can happen incredibly quickly. But if you're talking about systems where you've got a lot of systemic demand, um, it's not going to be like the Matterhorn because you've got a lot of historical uh, uh, machinery, right? It's gonna be a little bit more like Mount Fuji. You go up, you've got a long plateau at the top, and then it goes down. And, and along that plateau at the top, it's gonna to be quite quite, quite bumpy, not necessarily a volcanic center like Mount Fuji, but nevertheless, it's gonna be bumpy at the top. Um, but but you, you've got to realize that first of all, there's a slope at the end, which is the end game, and it's not terribly far away. I would suggest for fossil fuels as a whole, certainly within a decade. Um, and, and, and then it, 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 you also don't have another mountain ahead of you. It's not like we're suddenly going to go back to the glory days of the 2000s and get 3% you know, growth year in, in coal and stuff. That Those days are clearly over. Right. Well, let's talk about what uh, impact this might have, this report might have at, in Glasgow with COP26 uh, uh, meetings. Uh, do you think that this will change uh, the thinking of any of the uh, policymakers that are going to be meeting there? Yeah, I, I think this report is, is really significant. I mean, we put out a carbon tracker an, an analysis a month or so ago called looking at the um, feedback loops of the energy transition. One of the arguments we made was you get an intellectual feedback loop as people change their thinking. Um, so policymakers are emboldened to act. And so analysts are emboldened to up their forecast for the speed of change. And this is a very good example of that happening. And, and um, I think as the IEA shifts, other forecasters inevitably will be shifting as well because um, they don't want to be now seen to be out on a complete limb um, uh, 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 arguing for a future which is highly unlikely. Um, so that's, that's, that's important. And as they, those national forecasters shift, um, so politicians will realise that Actually, there's an awful lot of opportunities that they have to, um, to 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 get ahead of the game and to dominate these new growth technologies. This, I think, is the other point the IEA made very clearly. We, you and we have also been talking about this a lot. It's like you have these enormous new industries which are being built. They talk about tenfold increase in demand, a trillion dollar industry bigger than oil in in, in wind and turbine and turbines and, and, and hydrogen and so on and so forth. Um, and uh, people are now going to start to realize that that's where the opportunity lies and they need to be grabbing that and at the same time regulating differently and and also seizing the opportunities to curtail um uh, uh, emissions at very low cost because why wouldn't you so i no, i think this re is a really really significant report for cop actually well kingsville thank you very much for this really appreciate your insights as always thank you Malcolm. there is one other observation i don't know if it's worth talking about um but in spite of our enthusiasm for this, it is worth noting that the IEA is actually still very conservative in their forecasts for future cost falls in renewables and the future growth of renewables. And as a result of that, and for example, they're expecting the price of uh, solar electricity in the United States, which has been falling at 18% a year for the last decade, to fall at only 5% a year this decade, and then to stop falling next decade. That's the kind of conservative approach they have. And as a result, their growth rates for renewables are incredibly conservative after 2030. So the consequence of that is there's lots of room for technologies which um, are, are, shall we say, quite unlikely to materialize at scale, CCS, biomass, and so on and so forth. So 
it, it's a great report, but it's not. There, there are there are areas where where we still think there's a long way to go in terms of their thinking about the speed of the technology shift. 